I'm Shannon O'Brien. This is the podcast, Wisdom for the Rest of Us. With me, I'm E.T. Hansen, Eric. Recently, uh, just the other week, I was thinking about and reading one of those poems, which I published for uh, New Year's, The Snowstorm by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I was thinking about this rhythm the year goes through. At the end of the year, there's a lot of snow and life kind of dies under a layer of snow. And then in spring, it revives again. It becomes new. Life renews itself every year. And for some reason, we as human beings have laid the end of the year, or at least in the Western world, we laid the end of the year and the beginning of the year at this time of winter when it's coldest when nature has gone into hibernation or you know the, all the leaves are dead and waiting to spring into into new life and and our rhythm matches the rhythm of nature this death and renewal every year death and renewal and we have a ritual, kind of a strange, funny little quirky ritual that corresponds to this. And that's the ritual of the New Year's resolutions. We make resolutions every new year because we want to change. We want to, just like the, you know, the leaves that, that die and then they come new leaves sprout on the trees, we want to put our old selves to rest at the end of the old year and start afresh in the new year with new selves, with new little habits, with new better attributes, a new better me. And sometimes we succeed in these New Year's resolutions. Often we don't succeed. Sometimes they're, you know, unrealistic, uh, whatever. But it's a, it's a ritual that indicates to us that we have the need to change. Every year, all the time, again and again, we have this need to change. And I was wondering about this change. I was wondering about if it's even realistic, if people can change. And I was looking through the internet and I came across a really charming, beautiful, simple, straightforward, and I think very honest and true article in WikiHow, WikiHow about changing yourself. And it's written by Shannon O'Brien, who is a life coach. And she just put down, you know, six or seven points about how to change. You you write down the changes you want, you assess yourself whether it's possible, etc. And you change yourself. And, you know, you think you're kind of nowadays we're, we're kind of programmed to think about change in kind of a big way. A change is something you, you go to therapy to do. You, you take drugs, you, know, you, you meditate, you go into a Zen cloister. It's a, it's a big philosoph philosophical thing. But... Here's Shannon O'Brien says, no, six steps, you, you form a habit, you know what you want, and you can achieve change in your lifetime. Uh, maybe not the big change, just maybe not every change that you want, but you can achieve change. And it's simple, and it's easy, and it's doable. And I love that. I, I, it takes some of the, some of the, some of the, the daunting, you know, scariness out of, out of change by just saying, yeah, it's like, you, it's like fixing a car. You're, you're fixing yourself. Uh, and so I invited uh, Shannon to come and talk to us about change, about New Year's resolutions and changing ourselves, the need to change ourselves and how we can change ourselves. And uh, Shannon O'Brien is uh, founded uh, several years ago, uh, an online uh, human resources uh, life coaching institute called Whole You. That's W-H-O-L-E as in, you know, total you, you as in university, but just the letter U. You can find it on the on the uh, on the uh, on the interweb as as whole U dot info. W H O L E U dot info. So it's whole U dot info. Uh, check it out. She's got a lot of stuff there. She's got a lot of information there. She's got free seminars, free you know test seminars that you can you can visit if you want to hire her for a coach. You can ask her questions. It's it, it's a great website. She's a good person to go to when you when you. Well, when you're thinking about this, uh, you know, whether it's a change in your life or things like, you know, you got, need, need to learn how to make a better resume. She does all that. OK, G G Shannon, this this article I, 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 I loved and, and you deal with this kind of thing every day. You're te you're t teaching people how to change their lives and helping them change every day as a life coach. What are some of the steps? What are some of the things I have to do in practical sense to change my life? Yeah, so I think the word change, I actually prefer the word evolve, because change alludes to a, a, a fallacy or a delusion that, that we're going to change overnight and very quickly, and I don't think that that's possible. So I like to think of it more of an evolution. So 
change or evolution takes time. If you make a decision, you, you likely won't change overnight, but then you need to practice. And over time, you'll find yourself saying, oh, wow, I lost that weight that I wanted to lose, or I gained those skills that I didn't have before. So I think that we misunderstand that change is quick and we uh, um, are kind of uh, maybe want a quick fix. We want a pill that's gonna change it. But I think, you know, in my observation, change or evolution takes commitment and tenacity and essentially committing in a way that you know it's never going to end. <laughs> so you'll always need to eat healthy or you'll always need to exercise or you'll always need to practice that skill. Just for example, uh, my German skills. I, I, at one time I practiced more and now I'm pretty much can't speak it anymore because I didn't commit to, to practicing it. So I like to think of it as evolution and that we have to practice on a consistent basis in order to maintain that change. You said a lot right there. I'm, 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 I'm kind of impressed, a little bit daunted. First of all, um, what kind of time are we talking about? I'm, I, I'm a guy who likes it. I mean, I know, it's, I know there's no quick fix, but I'm a guy who likes the quick fix. What kind, if I want to stop eating poorly, if I want to stop eating healthy, what kind of time frame are we talking about to establish a habit and then to keep doing it? I think it's going to be different for everybody. And I'll say, and I'll, you'll probably... Uh, get annoyed with me that I sound like a broken record and, and keep on reminding everybody that change is going to look differently for everybody because maybe I'm a hundred pounds over my ideal weight or maybe I'm 20 pounds over my ideal weight. I can give a personal example that I was 40 pounds over my ideal weight for a variety of reasons, including pregnancy, but also that I was treating my body like a trash compactor because I was used to being 20 years old and being able to eat a bag or two of cookies at a time. And I love treats and had sweet teeth. And, you know, and then it was no longer possible, you know, your body changes and evolves. And, um, and so I was not wanting to accept that fact. I thought it was everybody else that was changing, but not me. And so for me personally, in order to lose that 40 pounds, I, I did have to make changes in my diet. And so um, I would say, so my daughter was born in 2018 and it, it honestly took me three and a half years to feel better, to look better, to lose that 40 pounds and get back to my previous weight. Now, is it going to take you three and a half years if you go to the gym vigorously every day, if you eat, you know, if you're, if you're drinking celery, celery juice diet every morning and cleansing your body and, and it's going to be different if you're on a, a I mean, they say that, you know, actors and actresses, when they're preparing for movie roles, they can get to get, you know, um, lose that weight or gain that weight in a month. So I think it depends on the resources that you have. And, and again, back to that tenacity or your choice of how badly you really want it. And, and so in, in essence, for most people, I would imagine that you can choose your own timeline unless you, um, you know, have any sort of physical, um, it's often probably mental, but you might even have some physical, um, you know, let's say DNA or programming that's keeping you away from, you know, uh, being as quick as other people might be able to be. You talk about tenacity. Um, is, is that, in your experience, the or one of the biggest reasons why people fail at changing because in the end they don't they're not really as as committed to it as they want to be. I think it comes back to your admitting and my admitting we want it quick we want it easy we want it yesterday we it's um it's a pain to have to keep doing it every day it might even get boring, um, but is there a way to have it be daily and and start to enjoy it and rather than think of it as a chore start to enjoy the things that are good for us you know i'm really enjoying the celery juice it's actually so refreshing and kind of reframe our thinking about the fact that yes tenacity or discipline because discipline sounds so militaristic and uh, we don't want to be you know a robot and we want to have freedom but they say there's actually some sort of freedom in discipline because you know, every morning you have to get up and drink that celery juice. I keep coming back to the celery juice and I can explain why. And then, you know, going to the gym at whatever time that you designate, and maybe it's flexible. You can go in the morning one day or go in the night the other day. But I do think that there's this repetition that is essential for any type of, what's change, evolution, movement um, that you want to see. So yes, 
tenacity, discipline, any word that you want to call it that's more uh, inspiring for you is necessary, a necessary part. And not everyone wants to do it because it's not, it's not typically seen as enjoyable. I think it's interesting that you said you have to reframe it. You have to enjoy drinking that celery juice or or whatever, maybe enjoy seeing the, the weight, the, the, the scale going down or, or, or something. I, I know when I, 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 I actually did do over the last two or three years, I lost quite a number of pounds too. And, and I, I didn't like the fasting. I did it by fasting. I didn't enjoy the fasting, but I enjoyed it when every week or so I saw that the scale was going down and, and I felt proud of it. And I, and I was, it became almost an addiction to get that little shot of dopamine when I saw the scale going down. That was, so there was some, I, I found something. I mean, if you're saying that you, you to, to change, you have to find something good about the change. Uh, I would, I, I see that in my experience also. Um, but you said one of the interesting things you said, because I, I live in Germany. So you said, you know, you, you spoke, you used to speak German, you're kind of losing your skills now, but do you need the German skills? And could it be that that's one of those things that you would like to change, but you don't really need to? And, and do we have a lot of changes that like a whole list, you know, a, ten, a hundred point list of New Year's resolutions that we want to do. But in fact, we only need one or two of those things. Yeah. And that comes back to personal individual choice. And so do I need to speak German? Um, no, no, I don't perceive a need right now. Do I want to speak German? I mean, the desire to speak German would be different, you know, if I didn't, I mean, so let's, let's say, for example, Italian. I don't need it. I speak in the United States. You know, Italian is mostly spoken in Italy, a tiny country, and I don't need it on my day to day, but I actually really want to. I have Italian ancestry. I love the way it sounds. So that's an example of like something that you just want to do because you enjoy it. Um, there's certain things. And now I could could have been like, OK, with accepting myself, body acceptance of I'm 40 pounds overweight and that's OK with me. I don't need to change. Why would I need to change? I'm not a fashion model or need to fit into a certain size. Um, and I could have accepted myself that way, but I, I did have a desire to get back to my, my regular weight um, that, that I perceived that was regular to me. Again, it's a personal choice, and I feel better that way. I could do the activities that I wanted to. I like yoga. I could fit on that bike. I could do the other thing. So for me, it was a perceived need, I suppose, based on my own value system or what do I what my lifestyle. But, but that's a good point, is that you have to perceive a need and perceive, perceive a, a desire as well. And um, sort of back to your, I like that you were liking what you saw with like, you know, it was almost a game, I'm sure, like, oh, great, I lost another pound this week or whatever it was, and rewarding yourself or just commending yourself. And as you said, being proud of yourself when you reach those milestones, however small, because ultimately it's, we're, it's just for ourselves. It shouldn't be trying to please anyone else. You're doing these changes, so you have to reward yourself because perhaps someone's going to say, oh, wow, you look great. I did see a friend who hadn't seen me in years. Wow, you look great. You look better than I've ever seen you, you know, um, and that's validating, but the validation has to come from yourself. And then there's sort of a, well, it's not really about the end goal. It's, a, it's also about that enjoyment. So enjoying back to enjoying the process and then also enjoying those milestones that pop up. I'm assuming that a lot of people come to you ho hoping to change their lives, needing help to change their lives. Do they come with like a, a long laundry list of things that, that they want to change, you know, like a, like a Christmas list, like, a, you know, I'm going to Santa, now I'm going to change every, I'll have a huge list, I'm going to be perfect. And, and if so, do you have to, how do you whittle that down? What, what do you tell them? Do they come with a long Christmas list? Perhaps, but they don't really share it with me. And, I, and so what I do, I call it career and life strategy. And when I began Whole You nine years ago or in 2012, I, I was calling it holistic development in three core areas. So wellness, career, and service. And over the time, it, it just seemed that people were more drawn to the career change. So that actually, at first I was sort of resentful. I wanna talk about everything. I wanna talk about service to society and wellness of body and mind. And you know, I never lost sight of those things and always integrate them. Hold on for one second, I'm gonna unplug the phone. Mm -hmm. Entschuldigung. <laughs> <laughs> Kein Problem. Yeah, I never lost sight of 
um, you know, the holistic approach. But what I found is that, is that I, I started to market myself as more of a career advisor and career coach. So then there's a pretty clear ask that they want. I want a new job. I want to be out of my current job. I want to find out what it is that I'm good at or what I'll enjoy. So it, it was kind of either one of five, 10 things that people were looking for. And it's, it's, it's good when you're able to identify what it is so you have a clear goal in mind. Otherwise, they don't quite know what they're working on. So, um, and yeah, if they had, well, even I'll give an example. So I want a job, but I could go into marketing and I could go into sales, but I also really like fitness and, and, and people are kind of all over the place. And part of my job, so to speak, is to help people narrow down what they really want. And I have a system for fig helping people figure out, well, let, I know you could probably apply to 10 different places, but let's just try to focus on one, just one, one that's really, really aligned and really a fit. And yes, you can apply again and again, however many times you want. But for you and I, we're going to put all our eggs in this one basket so that we can practice what it's like to focus. Because, yeah, you could have 10, a laundry list of 10 different things you want to change. But maybe back to your question about do you need it and do you enjoy it? You know, um, maybe there's a priority. Again, there's new job, new relationship, um, moving. There could be a whole bunch of things that you want to achieve in your life. Now, many people actually, when it rains, it pours, and they just kind of do everything at once. Or you could make a list to, to try to say, well, what's really number one? And maybe sometimes number one will lead to number two. For example, if I feel better about myself having lost weight, I'm more likely to attract a partner that... Um, that I feel good about and vice versa, or I'm in the right mindset to attract someone who fits into my life. Um, or maybe moving to a place that has people who are more like-minded. Like uh, so, so sometimes those goals can tie into each other. When people come to you and they want to change their career, you, you try to get them to focus on one thing, to put their eggs all in one basket. How important is that, is, is doing that one thing? Because to my mind, I, if you, try 10 things at the same time, one of them may work out, see? And, and so, but, but that doesn't seem to be your thinking or your experience. Um, not that it's not my thinking or my experience. It happens to be the process with this one career program that I, that I specialize in or that I've created. And, and that's part of the, pro just happens to be part of the process. Um, that is another way to do it, to say, let me try to do 10 different things and, you know, let me play violin and drums and the clarinet and kind of see which one I like. It depends on your timeline. It depends on your budget, on how much time you have on your hands. So um, you're welcome to try as many things as you want. It, just in the context of this particular five-week or five-step program that I do with clients that I've just found that it's easier to try to help focus because I know firsthand that it's that, that it's easy to get scattered and, and all over the place. And I focus on the process. So I can go into more detail, but it's, um, it's essentially a five-step process that's split in two. And the first is reflecting, the internal work. And then the second part is the external work. So the resume, the cover letter, the LinkedIn, your professional brand and what the world sees. But I find people kind of jump in at that point, which it kind of neglects or negates all of this internal work. Well, what is your, what are your materials actually even saying? Who are you sending them to? What do you want them to know about you? And that happens in the first part. So uh, it's a two part process. And I just say at the middle point, okay, great. You've reflected and you have all these clues about what you want. Let's just pick one job and create those materials for that one job. And again, as I said, you can replicate that process as many times as you want. You said that the the, uh, the the internal work is like the prerequisite of the exterior work of the actual getting out and jobs and sending around resumes. What does that entail? What kind of internal work are you talking about? One of the, the first steps I encourage people to do is to look at their values. And I think our values shift over time. And uh, so there's an exercise. It's all the exercises that I present are very, very simple including this one. So it's a list of 50 values. And 
it's actually <laughs> more complicated. I mean, it's a simple exercise, but it's complicated because you're saying, well, I value all of those things. But again, we need to start to prioritize. So we whittle down the 50 to your top 10, and then we whittle down the top 10 to your top five. And so is it that you uh, value wellness or that you value wealth or family or adventure or um, fame? You know, these are all legitimate values that everybody might have in, in one degree or another. But for you to figure out what top, your top five values that are driving the show, so to speak, in this moment, in this snapshot of your time, could be different from five years ago. It could be different from yesterday. We're not the same person. We don't have to be the same person that we were yesterday. We don't have to have the same values. So that's one of the key exercises in the internal work to figure out what is driving your desire to change. Okay, let's talk about what you actually do. You, you're, you're a life coach. You uh, founded an institution called Whole U, like Whole University with H, with W H W H O L E university, but just the you, so it's a whole you, which is, I think is very funny and very good. Um, and it's in, on your, your website, there are a couple of whole you's and there are a couple of Shannon O'Brien. So be sure if you're <laughs> going to type this into, into the website, into Google, be sure to, to type in w-h-o-l-e-u dot info. That's the correct, that's the correct website, right? What, what, what kind of other things do you do? I know you offer a free seminar or a free testing seminar. You give uh, uh, webinars, I think. Is that correct? What, 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 what else do you do? What do you offer at Whole U? Thank you, Eric. Thanks for spelling it all out there because there is some <laughs> confusion. I actually have a trademark of Whole U, and I know that other people have tried to get that trademark or start their own initiatives. And, and I think that it's great that, that the people are focusing on the Whole U because there are so many elements to feeling whole and feeling complete. So anybody who's doing this type of work is 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 great. Um, I don't consider myself a life coach, actually. I think a lot of people call themselves that, but I do just a little bit of a play on words, you know, career and life strategy or career advisor, life strategy advisor. But life coach, for some reason, doesn't sit well with me. It's not how I describe myself, but still in, in that realm of career and life um, development. And I do offer a whole host of things. I, I was working in higher education for seven years before I started Whole U. So I started Whole U in 2012. Previous to that, I was working at MIT in, in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, helping to promote inventors and innovation and entrepreneurship in general across the institution, which was very fascinating. And I had worked in cross-cultural consulting and before that had worked at Harvard University at the Foundation for Intercultural and Race Relations, promoting diversity. And before that, I was living in Japan for two years studying peace studies and public administration. So all of these different interests, but always promoting something that I thought was of value, diversity, innovation. And, and, and so when I was in Japan, so previous to that, um, in my undergrad, when I was graduating, 9-11 happened, which was a very like a big game changer for me, because especially because I had just been to the Middle East for the first time uh, right before 9-11, and I just saw what a beautiful place it was and how hospitable and generous people were there and just how there was this mis miscommunication happening in the media, and I wanted to be a part of that educational media that was showing a balanced view uh, when you didn't have the opportunity, as you know, to travel to Berlin or wherever it is, you can have a perception of what it's like, but it's probably going to be different if you see it on a screen versus you're there in person. So all of these issues that I'm talking about are kind of macro level and, um, and do require other people to kind of be involved. And as I went along my career, I wanted to whittle it down and get a little bit down to the micro micro of like, I can do this all by myself. I don't need an institution behind me to promote this. And also micro in terms of you as an individual, you and I and all of the individuals that I work with, just helping them um, feel inspired and feel empowered. So in, in, since 2012, I've been creating a host of different offerings. It was workshops in person, that's pre-COVID. Um, I had studied educational technology, so I created a, a platform online and created online courses um, and developed this curriculum, a very simple curriculum that I started to describe. 
that internal, and that, that's kind of my MVP, the minimum viable product uh, or, or process that I created is this five-step process to help people figure out how to transition their career. And I have some free resources for people to check out. I created a YouTube channel and a podcast. They're all accessible from the website that you mentioned. And, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm continuing to evolve whole you myself according to how clients are responding and, and what's useful to them. But I have found that this five-step process is really the process that is most applicable to everybody. And I've worked with men and women from their 20s to their 60s, from all over the world, in all different industries, all different levels, from CEOs to the mailroom. I don't think that, um, I think this process is applicable to anybody. I thought it was very interesting. You said most people come to you because they want a career change. Okay, I, I understand that because when I think of changing, that's the big thing. The career is the huge, the, you know, the monster, the, the elephant in the room. And that's what we want to spend money on changing. I, I can imagine that. But you said you have a kind of a broader also look at it. You have three aspects, I think, holistic, practical, and service. Is that correct? You were right. There's three areas. Wellness. And within that, there's three elements, wellness of mind, wellness of body, and wellness of spirit. So mind, body, spirit, integration. We were talking about uh, eating cookies and, and wanting to gain weight. That's obviously in the wellness category. And it can be argued that if, unless you are well, you're probably not going to do, in any, uh, do well in any other area of your life. So wellness, to take care of your wellness first is your first responsibility to yourself and to others. So mind, body, spirit. And then from that baseline, then you can do good, do well in your job and choose a job that's in align with, the, with who you really want to be in the world, not who your parents wanted you to be or your peer group or anybody else. But, but when you are your best self, this is this new term, best self, living your best life, however you want to describe it, what job would you choose then when you're honest with yourself? So that's where the career uh, comes in. And like you said, the career is, is like a monster or, or a very large part of our life because it's where we're spending our most, t most of our time, most of our energy. And, and it is a key component to just everyday living. And so there is this concept of dream job and then there is also a concept of, well, I just need money to pay the bills and, you know, to, to, to live in the world and get along in the world, depending on my value system. And so those are kind of been kind of mishmashy lately where people want a dream job that pays a lot of money. And there's this, um, maybe you've seen a diagram, the ikigai or these overlapping circles saying, well, you have to get paid, but you also need to love it and it needs to serve others. So that's where this other element of service comes in. You take care of yourself, you have a job, take care of the ones around you, and then you can start thinking about other people and, and being of service to other people. And when I mentioned that I studied in Japan, I actually received a fellowship from Rotary International. There's Rotary clubs all over the world and their motto is service above self. So in my early 20s, when I did this fellowship, I was actually not brainwashed, but, but you know, I was very into this concept of service above self, which is quite literally serving others before yourself. And, you know, I've thought about that since. And, well, that's not necessarily right to put someone else before yourself. I mean, the classic put on your own mask, oxygen mask before you help others. Um, serve yourself, help yourself, and then help others when you're in a good place. Because if you're serving or, or uh, serving from an empty cup or, um, you know, a dirty cup or whatever, um, you know, it's probably not going to be as successful, the result of your service. And, and, and maybe now I would argue that you can probably do it, serve others as you're simultaneously serving yourself. And that's actually how I feel with my work with Whole You is oftentimes the clients I'm working with, there's this mutual benefit that we're receiving. I'm learning so much from them as much as they're learning from me. And I'm also healing or evolving as I learn from other people in their experience. And so um, service, again, is a personal choice. There's Mother Teresa, there's Soup Kitchen, there's Library in Africa. There's all different, there's serving your own children or your own family, 
uh, being generous with money if they don't have it or, or whatever it is or whatever it looks like to you. So service is a huge wide spectrum as well. Uh, why is it important? I mean, it seems like it seems like con contraintuitive. It seems like, uh, you know, I'm me. I, I should serve my own interests first. And other, if I give something to other people, that's just taking away something from me. Yet everyone I talk to, you know, philosophers or, 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 or spiritual leaders, they all say, no, it's all about serving, even though you, you've mentioned the prerequisite, of course, that you, you know, you can survive. You're not taking your you have to put on your own oxygen mask first. But why in general is service to others important? I would say I, I would venture to guess that it's actually not important in in like a flat um, statement of like service is important uh, universally. If it's not important to him or her, it's not important. Again, it's a value. It's a choice. Um, it just so happens that and maybe this is like people are picking up what I'm putting down. So I'm, I'm, I'm attracting these people who think service is important because I'm saying, hey, I, I care about it and I think it's important. Um, so personally, I think it's important. And the people that come to me say, I mean, time and time again, I just want to help people. That's what people say. Their job, they just want it to be valuable and in that value is that it's value for other people and not just for themselves. So um, the, the, some people don't think it's important, some people do, and I'm usually hanging out with the people that do because I, I do personally think it's important. And why, I, it just feels good. I think that that's what it comes down to is that when you smile at someone that's contagious and they smile back, uh, when you open the door for someone, well, it feels good, thank you. I think that there's just a feeling that it feels good to help others, and, and likely there's a recipro reciprocation that happens, but that's not the reason you do it, although it does feel uh, like a stab in the back if you help someone and they punch you in the face. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I would say it's not important as a universal concept, but it, it feels good to some who, and again, there's people on the spectrum of narcissism and um, sociopathy and, and psycho psych you know, psychopaths that probably doesn't feel good. So it probably depends on what, where you fall in that spectrum as well. This has been a really fascinating discussion. Uh, and it would be, uh, you know, if, if I had the money, I would, I would I'd come over and then and buy a love hour so I could just talk to you constantly about, <laughs> about this stuff. That would be great. But be, be, before we, before we uh, end this, um, let's get back to this idea of New Year's resolutions and, and this change that we're thinking about. We tend to change at the end of the year, the beginning of the new year of, of changing ourselves. If you were to say, there's one big mistake you can make when finding a change and one big thing you can do right when trying to change something. What would those two things be? The big mistake and the big thing you can do right. I think the biggest mistake comes back to what we said at the beginning is thinking that it's going to happen quickly, thinking that change is going to happen quickly. Um, so that seems to be a mistake, a common misunderstanding a misconception or desire, you know, I want it now, I want it yesterday versus I'm willing to work for it. And that leads into probably the second thing that you can do right is pick the right thing for you in this moment. What, you know, I'm learning German. Why? Because I think it's cool. Cool for who? Cool because my friends know German and I, you know, and, and, or is it, is it because of other people or is it because of you? Is it something that you enjoy, that you actually enjoy and you actually want? So I think what you could do right is to pick the right things for you that are honest to you and that would be enjoyable. That's actually very good advice. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we, I, I'd like to bring this to a close. It's been a really good discussion. Is there something you'd like to say that you think is important that I haven't asked? I appreciate you having me on here. I think it's so cool that we're in, in, you know, exchanging. I'm in Florida at the moment and you're in, in Germany. And this is just um, it's so nice to be able to connect with people around the world uh, about the topic of, of change and quote unquote self-improvement. Um, one resource that I would you know, suggest that I always suggest is my favorite philosopher, Alan Watts. And I actually sent you the link to it as well. And this is like a different, um, I don't think he's cynical. But he would say, you, can, you can't improve yourself 
you can't change yourself and you can't improve the world or change the world. So stop trying. So I'm just saying it as like a counter argument to all of that I'm talking about because I can sort of hold all of these different philosophies and think, and I, and I do believe in everybody's truth. So if this that I've been saying sounds like a bunch of hogwash, um, you know, that's fine too. <laughs> you know, it's really like whatever works for you. This is just um, one opinion, but I'm, I'm open to hearing other opinions as well. And I just appreciate the opportunity to share. We all we all are kind of dissatisfied with ourselves. We want to be some better or have more money or do another job or, or be thinner or something. We always want to improve or change in some way. But do you think and, and I, I guess it's legitimate, right? It's legitimate to want a, new, a different job if you're unhappy in the old job. But would you say that despite all the things that we could do better deep inside, we're still actually perfect human beings just because we're normal human beings? Yes, I think that that's fair to say is that we're perfect as we are. We're perfect and whole and complete just as we are. And and people like Louise Hay or this positive psychology type thinking would, would you know, suggest that you look in the mirror and you say that I love myself. I accept myself. Everything is fine. It, even though it feels like a total lie <laughs> that you fake it till you make it until you kind of absorb this type of thinking. Um, I think that there is a lot of truth to that. You know, they say before children learn how to be in the world and are, and are um, you know, influenced by society, they're just little pure babies. And, and actually, though, <laughs> there is a lot of not not evil, but they're crying they're, they, when they're toddlers. They're, they're trying to figure themselves out. I mean, I think unless you think that's perfect. I mean, this is a whole other discussion, you know, about what is perfection and, and, um, and that's a kind of a slippery slope topic, but I would say you don't have to do anything. You don't have to change. You don't have to be of service. You don't need to evolve. You don't need to, a new job. And actually I think the real challenge is to enjoy this moment for everything that it is and everything that it's not and know that it's, a, um, the result of all of the choices that you've made up until this moment, that's what's happening is like your karma or your choices are bringing this moment. So enjoy it, learn from it. If there's challenge, like learn through it and, 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 um, and grow through it, grow from it. So, um, I think that's the ultimate challenge is to be okay with the moment. Thank you. Shannon O'Brien, uh, uh, founder and CEO of Whole You. That's a whole you dot info. Uh, not a life coach, but a, but a, a, a career and life uh, advisor, counselor. Great advice. A lot of wisdom here. I love that. Thank you so much for coming. And I wish you all the luck, all the love, all the happiness and, and success in the world. Likewise, Eric. Thank you so much. Vielen Dank. E.T. Hansen, that's me, is an American writer from Hawaii living in Berlin. I write novels and nonfiction in German and English. I teach the art of fiction and I podcast about life and language and seeking wisdom. For more information, check out our publishing website, hulainc.com. That's H-U-L-A, like the dance, I-N-K, like the printed page, in one word, hulainc.com. The music in this video was performed by our producer and editor, Lothar Rosengarten. Lothar is a musician who lives and performs in Berlin. For more information about him, please visit his website, lothar-rosengarten.de. That's L-O-T-H-A-R-R-O-S-E-N-G-A-R-T-E-N.de. You can support Hula Inc., Lothar and me, by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash hula inc. And don't forget to share our videos and our podcasts and subscribe to this podcast and to vimeo.com slash hula inc. But mostly we just hope that you enjoy and have something from our work. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. And we wish you all the love, luck, and happiness in this world.